All right, Jesus tells us, uh, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus' teaching and his uh, modeling of this passage. Uh, God, I feel like, um, like a lot of your words, sometimes I've interacted with this passage with my shame, and I've thought like, ah, oh, the burden is light. Why am I struggling so hard? You know, but God, that's not, uh, that's not what you are saying here. And so I appreciate that Adam is going to come and uh, kind of bring some life to these words and help us to uh, see what they've meant in his life and what they can mean for us. Lord, I ask that you would, uh, you would just anoint Adam with your spirit, give him your words to say, and Lord, that you would give us ears to hear. Amen. <clears throat> All right, I didn't test out the mic. Is it, can you guys hear me? Awesome. Well, uh, welcome everyone. It's been a super long time since I've been up here at the pulpit, like a long time, like in the before, before times. <laughs> I think you guys know what I mean. Uh, in fact, the last couple of times I preached was back when um, uh, our church was shut down and I would be preaching on Facebook Live, usually in the comfort of uh, my in-law's uh, cabin at Miwok, which is always, it's kind of cool. But, um, yeah, you know, after that, when the church reopened up, um, I'll be honest, our family was a little more cautious. Um, we didn't return right away. Uh, when we did, we were, we were masked to the T, you know, double masking and all that stuff. And um, right when I was getting, starting to get comfortable, um, then our school year started. Now, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, teaching here. Uh, at least in my school, uh, in a normal year, I teach six classes out of seven. You get like a prep period where you get, to, uh, you get to grade papers and prepare for lessons and things like that. And in my school, uh, I would usually have on average about 160 students, which is you know a fair amount of students to keep track of and remember all their names. That's why like, if I ever forget your name here at church, there's like only so many names I can keep in my head. <laughs> just, just saying. And um, this past year, they bought out my prep period. And uh, they've actually done that before. The elders know that. I've, I've worked through all seven classes. And uh, even during those past years, I think it was usually my class load was around 190. I think one year it actually like crept over 200 students. Well, this past year, I had over 230 students. It was a crazy amount. Um, just dealing with all these students, um, not having time to really prepare adequately or grade to the best that I wanted to do. You know, I really felt busy and burdened. Not only that, I helped out with the school, things like track and cross country, uh, you know, still doing my uh, uh, duties as an uh, elder, as well as uh, being a parent and being a spouse. But, um, you know, this past year, the reason why I haven't been preaching was I was just in a season of busyness. Now, uh, can I get a raise of hands? I know, like, last, last week, Andrew didn't want you to raise hands, apparently. I, just, <laughs> I don't know why. But ha have anyone been in, like, a really busy season before in their life? Where, to me, I always think of it as uh, the spinning plates. You guys ever seen that, the spinning plates? where someone puts a plate on a stilt, and they're spinning one thing, and they're rushing around, they're spinning the next plate, and spinning the next plate, and it's like every obligation, just running around, spinning a plate, worried about the next plate. I don't want that plate to fall. I don't want that obligation to fail. I'm running around and just being frantic. Well, this past year, you know, it's, it's something God's reminded me over and over again, and when I was thinking about what to talk about this morning, you know, God just said, hey, just, just 
talk about what, what I just went, uh, put you through, right? Talk about how do you deal with seasons of busyness. And so this morning, I want to talk about uh, three points, uh, three things God has uh, laid on my heart. And the first point is going to be about work itself. Uh, the second point is going to be about resting. And the last point is going to be on resting in the Lord. Well, my first point here about work, let me just start off in saying work is good. It may not seem like that to most of us, but work is good. You know, in Genesis 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. You know, God created us to work, not in some sadistic sense or not like he was punishing us, but to subdue the earth and have dominion over every living creature, as it mentions in Genesis 1. In other words, all of life, culture, and work is to reflect the beauty and the glory of God. This is the emphasis of scriptures, um, throughout the scriptures here about work. You know, it doesn't matter what your job is, whether you are an elder, a construction worker, a teacher, an entrepreneur, um, you, you're working part-time, you're working full-time, you're a stay-at-home mother, whatever it is that God has put you in, you know, work is rooted in God's good creation. And it's to reflect his glory. You know, really, anything in our lives is about reflecting God's glory. We see, we see this plainly laid out in that Genesis 2, verse 15 that I mentioned before. You know, uh, Jesus himself had a job. He was a carpenter. His earthly father, Joseph, was also a carpenter. God himself even got his hands dirty when he made man of dust from the ground. You know, not only did God command us to work, but being created in his image as a creator, we are hardwired with a desire to create, to work. But I know how it is in work. Sometimes it's your boss. Sometimes it's your coworkers. Sometimes it's the job itself. Sometimes it's the people you're put in charge of. And it's hard. There are struggles. But the one thing that really helps me is knowing who my true boss is. You know, the Lord Jesus may not be your crew leader at your job. He may not be physically sitting behind a desk watching your every move. He might not be the one signing your checks. But he is the one you work for. I know when you have a job in leading people, as I do as a teacher, I want to lead my students the way Christ leads us. No, I know in teaching, there are certain students that are like super easy to get along with. They're just like super energetic, great personality. They do all their work. It's, it's about like 10% of the students. <laughs> most, most kids I deal with cause me frustrations at certain times because I want what's best for them. And, and what they want doesn't co-align with what I want. You know, the majority of kids, usually at the end of the semester, and we just went through this, um, I'll get these kids saying, well, you know, I have like a 20%. How do I get that up to a 70%? There's like three days left in the semester. <laughs> you know, um, when, whenever we talk about this as teachers, I, I've mentioned this with my wife, with my coworkers, there's always a certain joke that we, we kind of tell each other. And it says, well, you know, we need to get you a little uh, blueprint. It's a blueprint to this car. It's called a DeLorean. And in this DeLorean, you, you build a flux capacitor. And uh, <laughs> you go back in time, you start doing your work. But even though I joke around about that, I would never say that to my students. Um, here, here's the reason why. Like, when we come to God, does God tell us, well, here's the things you messed up on. No, God comes beside us in grace, loves us, and lifts us up. And even with those troubled students, I try to extend that same grace and mercy to them. You know, for some of them, I'm laying out, here's the path for you to succeed. For some, it might be a hard conversation to say, you're, you're not going to pass this class, but let's see how you can get those tools to do well the next year. But I never want to be cavalier about my relationship with my students. I want to lead them. I want to love them. Most importantly, I want to shine God's 
loving grace back into my students. You know, um, Paul had this in mind in Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24, when he said, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ who you are serving, in Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24. Well, the next time uh, you have a boss, and maybe your boss reminds you of Bill Lumberg from uh, Office Space. Yeah, um, yeah, can you come in on Saturday today? Yeah. And you feel frustrated or angry, maybe not even compelled to do your job. Take a moment and pray. And seek God's grace in Christ. And remember that it is Jesus who you're really working for. As it says in Proverbs 16, verse 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. You know, when you're, when you're having a tough boss or tough coworkers, we need, to, we need to understand this job, that moment is in serving Christ. And we want to show that love, that supernatural love, where they'll take notice. They might not understand it. They may make fun of you for it. But they know you're, you're acting differently from this culture. So when you are in a season of busyness, first of all, just know that your work can glorify God. And that will truly lighten your load. Now, I shouldn't mention, though, when you're in the midst of a busy season. It's one thing to be reminded that working for God is helpful. However, sometimes the struggle is in the tiredness, right? You come home from a job, maybe you're a stay-at-home parent, and um, your spouse comes home, and you're just so tired from those kids, right? Understandable, right? I'll give you a hint, my kids aren't perfect. <laughs> but you're tired. And in, the, in that tiredness, you could have the best of intentions. But when you're tired, it does strain your relationships. And, and most often, that plate that starts wobbling around is the one with the ones we love the most. And so during this past season of busyness, God reminded me to rest. Now, the Bible places high value on rest and peaceful living. During uh, Jesus' earthly ministry, he himself escaped the busyness of the crowds occasionally to renew his strength. As Mark 6.31 says, Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to his disciples, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. You know, it's difficult, almost impossible, to hear God's still and quiet voice sometimes when we're in the midst of these 21st century crowds. And so we need to take the time to rest and hear from our Lord. You know, the Bible speaks repeatedly and quite highly of rest. It's a repeated theme throughout Scripture, beginning with the creation week in Genesis 2. Right? God created for six days, and then he rested. It's not because God was tired, but he wanted to set a standard for mankind to follow. You know, in the Ten Commandments, they made resting a Sabbath, on Sabbath a requirement of the law in Exodus. God said, remember the Sabbath. It wasn't wasn't something new. It was something that was already established. It had been around since creation. You know, all of God's people and their servants and the animals were to have one day in seven to rest. Now, a command to rest wasn't an excuse to be lazy. You know, people were working hard for six days. But God is very serious about rest. And to be honest, rest doesn't come naturally for us. It really doesn't. To rest, we have to trust that God will take care of things for us. We have to set aside that time to rest and, and, and understand, guess what? The world's going to keep spinning. Those problems that we have, it, it, the world's not going to come crashing down if we rest. You know, from the beginning, in, in Genesis 3, when we decided that we would start making all the decisions, mankind has become more tense and less able to relax. It was in this disobedience in the garden that started the problem. But obedience now will bring rest 
that God so desires for us. Relaxing our grip on our own lives, our careers, our families, and giving them over to God in faith is the best way to relax. And one thing in resting, we have to learn to say no to certain things. That's something God keeps reminding me of. You know, sometimes you have so many plates spinning that people keep adding plates on and, and you get overwhelmed. You know, it's okay to say no to certain obligations. Uh, there's been times at my school they say, hey, can you come in and do this? No, I can't. Can you come and do this extra shift? No, I can't. I'm going to be honest with you right now. The last, um, at least two, maybe three times I've been asked to preach, I said no. I don't, I don't say that like lightheartedly. I know as an elder I'm kind of called to, to preach for the congregation, but I had so much on my plate in this past school year that I knew that, first of all, I wouldn't have the time necessary to adequately prepare to have God speak to me so I can speak to you all. And if I was to spend that time, certain plates would stop spinning. I would have less time with my kids, less time with my wife. You know, I would love to say, like, hey, I'll just stop, start teaching less. That would be nice, but I kind of need money to provide for my family, right? Now, I'm, I'm not saying to say no to church obligations. It's probably one of the first times someone's up here in the pulpit saying, hey, say no to church obligations. <laughs> uh, that's not what I'm getting at. In fact, um, one of my earlier sermons a few years ago, my sermon was on the benefits and awesomeness of serving in the church. But we have to understand when it's okay to say no. You know, if, 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 if you're being asked to do something and we should have that spirit that, oh my gosh, I get to serve God. I get to love others. I get to pour this in to the church. Please, please do that. But if, if, you're, if you're overburdened and you get asked for something and it becomes something that's a distraction, a burden, then you're really not serving the church. You're serving your own pride. You're just wanting to be held up within the church. You're not wanting to serve in the church in that capacity. And so I say this in all seriousness. I, I really, truly hope you guys have a heart for serving. But it's okay to say no sometimes. You know, another way to rest is literally to sleep. It's a good way to rest. Uh, let me preface this by saying I understand many people have sleeping problems that are uh, medical in nature, uh, sometimes psychological in nature. And when I talk about rest and sleeping, um, I don't want to infer anything like if you're not um, sleeping well, that you're at odds with God. Or if you do sleep well, you and God are on the right page. Okay? <laughs> That's not what I'm saying here. But I do believe that sleep is something that God gives us to show us our reliance on him. You know, I know for myself, whenever I have a tough time sleeping, it's usually because I'm anxious about something good or bad. Um, in fact, um, I've had two bouts of insomnia in the past three weeks. I'm usually like known throughout the family as like the guy that can sleep the easiest. But... Um, I don't know what it is. Like, when I leave my house, when I go on vacation, like, I just have a tough time sleeping. And I think part of it is that I just have this false sense of security at home. Like, nothing can happen at home, right? And then I go, uh, I, we went to Disneyland. I was having a tough time sleeping in the hotel because, I don't know, I think, like, every little noise is, like, waking me up. I just I couldn't sleep well. And so then uh, I started prepping for the sermon. I started thinking about like not sleeping. And so then we went camping last week. And so I guess it was just in my head. And so I had another awesome few nights of not sleeping. <laughs> but, you know, in these times, we need, to, we need to pray that God, please just let me give the day over to you. 
Now, I'd love to say, like, when, because I was praying these prayers. I'd love to say, like, as soon as I prayed that prayer, like, I went to sleep. It doesn't happen because, you know, even in that prayer, God is just showing me I need to be more reliant on him. You know, it says in Psalms 4.8, in peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Getting a good night's rest is a gift from God. And Jesus himself wasn't opposed from getting some shut-eye. Right? If you think about uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 37 and 38, and when a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that I was already filling. But he was in the stern. That's Jesus. He was asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So, you know, if Jesus was uh, down with getting some sleep, I think we should be down with it too, right? But think about even in that windstorm, like, oh my gosh, who, who else could go to sleep in something like that? Like the boat's filling up with water, waves are crashing. Jesus is just there, like, probably snoring, right? Just... Why? Because his faith was in God. Right? He, he knew who was protecting him. Now, living your life by faith in Christ will lead you to trust in the Lord as you sleep instead of laboring away at another important task. But, um, you know, the point I'm getting at is, like, when you're in one of these busy seasons, please don't sacrifice sleep to try to catch up over and over again. Because when you do that, it will strain your relationships. If you're sacrificing sleep over and over again to try to catch up, to keep those plates spinning, not only will your relationships with your, your loved ones be strained, but your relationship with God will be strained. It says in Psalm 127, verse 2, In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those who he loves. Now, in this past season, he's taught me about work is for the Lord. Work is good. He's taught me about the importance of rest. But the most important thing he's shown me in this past year and many times is that we need to rest in the Lord. In uh, Colossians 3, verse 17, it says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Or in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all in the, to the glory of God. So for the Christian... The ultimate rest is found in Christ. He invites all those who are weary and burdened to come to him and cast our cares on him. It's only in him that we find our complete rest. Rest from the cares of the world, from the sorrows that plague us, and from the need to work to make ourselves acceptable to him. You know, we no longer observe the Jewish Sabbath because Jesus is our Sabbath rest. In him we find complete rest from the labors of our self-effort because he alone is holy and righteous. We can now cease from our spiritual labors and rest in him, not just one day a week, but always. You know, in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We must be intentional about making time to rest in Jesus. Let's make the efforts to sit at his feet and enjoy him. As it says in Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Now, the uh, Hebrew word that was translated as rest also means to be at peace or to be still or to be quiet. Uh, in place of rest in the Lord throughout scriptures, uh, some translations will say, be still before the Lord, or be silent before the Lord, or surrender yourself to the Lord, and be still in the presence of the Lord. You know, these versions convey the essential idea that to rest and to be at peace, one must dwell in the presence of God and surrender to his lordship. You know, from earlier, knowing that our work can glorify God it's definitely uplifting, but we have to take it a step further. That in our work, our obligations, in our busyness, we need to rest in the Lord. We need to cast our burdens and our cares on him. 
we still need to do, we still do what we need to do in our jobs, in all of our obligations. But we rest in the knowledge that we serve a sovereign God who's in control. You know, in the Old Testament, God promised people, or the people of Israel, a life of peace in the promised land and rest in his presence. In Exodus uh, 33, verse 14, the Lord, repli- the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. But this restful, peaceful living depended on the Israelites remaining faithful and obedient to God alone by keeping their covenant with him. And to those whose hearts strayed from him, God said they would never enjoy his rest. Uh, in, in Psalms 95, verses 7 through 11, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me as they tried me, through, though they had already seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. You know, eventually, because of widespread disobedience and unfaithfulness, the nation of Israel was taken into captivity in Babylon. And returning from exile, once again, the promise of rest in the Lord's presence was presented. So don't be afraid, Jacob, my service, my servant. Do not be dismayed, Israel, for I will bring you home again from distant lands, and your children will return from their exile. Israel will return to a life of peace and quiet, and no one will terrorize them, as it says in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 10. But again, the people failed to learn that resting in the Lord meant surrendering wholly to him. Now in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews declares the good news that those who believe in Jesus Christ can enter his rest. As I mentioned in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, first part of chapter 4, God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news, that God has prepared this rest, has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. You know, as believers, we are not granted immunity from life's storms, seasons of busyness, right? We all know we go through them. But we have a choice on how we react in those times. You know, our natural reaction, like I mentioned with the plate spinning, is to run around frantically spinning those plates, worried about the next obligation, the next thing I have to do. I have this list of things I need to do. Or we can rest in the Lord's presence, being confident that he is sovereignly in control. I'm not saying to let those plates fall, but I'm saying to rest in God while you're doing it. He is sovereign. You know, as Nick mentioned at the start here, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. You know, the, the, the writer of Hebrews also tells us that there's a future final rest for all of us believers in heaven. But in the meantime, we can rest in the Lord by taking everything, all of our burdens, problems, anxieties, take it to him in prayer. We can tell God what we need, even as we remember every good thing he does for us, every amazing thing that he does for us moment by moment. And when I say he does so many good things, like there's an infinite amount of good things he does for us daily that we take for granted. Every breath we take is a gift from God. Every breath. You know, right here and now, we can quiet ourselves, be still and surrender ourselves to the Lord. We can see him as Isaiah did, high and lifted up. He is sovereign over the whole earth, over our lives, over every enemy, both internal and external, human and spiritual. We can peacefully wait for him. We can be steadfast, longing, and always looking to him for help. This is how we rest in the Lord. Now, a great example of the consequences of busyness is showcased 
in Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. And uh, when I decided I was going to start preaching on busyness, and I'll, I'll look up some sample sermons, see like where people went with this, and like this uh, passage was in like every single sermon. You know, it's the story of Mary and Martha. And it reads, picking up in 38, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he had said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You know, in every time I've kind of read through this passage, every time I've seen a sermon, been a kid hearing the sermon, we're always called to be like Mary, right? We need to sit at the Lord's feet. Great words. I don't know about you, but I'm like a planner. I, I, my wife is too. We're just, yeah, like spontaneous for us is usually like, okay, we're going to do something in like 10 days from now. <laughs> That's like spontaneous. But, you know, anytime I go through this passage, I would always think about, what about Martha? I mean, she's doing preparations for the Lord, right? I mean, aren't those good things? Like, I start thinking about those what needs to be done? And I always find myself, like, thinking about Martha. And uh, in this past time, when I was uh, reading through and praying through the scripture, like, one thing kind of stood out to me. And it was in uh, verse 40. I think on the next slide, it's, I was trying to make that, st- oh, no, no, go back one. Yeah, it's barely underlined. I, I wanted to make that stand out more, but oh, well. It said, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations. Why is this important? It's, it's not the preparations that she was doing that were wrong. It's that she was distracted by it. That she placed a higher value in doing the preparations and letting jealousy of her sister take a higher priority than the purpose of serving God. You know, it's not, it's, God is not saying, hey, don't, do, uh, don't serve people. Don't help your neighbor. In fact, if we take this passage in context, you know what comes right before this passage? It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'll pick that up. Well, let's go back to verse 27. You know, a lawyer was asking God about uh, what must he do to uh, inherit eternal life. And, um, you know, the, the lawyer asked, hey, we need to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. I jump into verse 29. And so then he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, a man was coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him up, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You know, all this to say, certainly Jesus commends this type of service to others and helping out those in need. The problem with Martha was not that she was serving. It was not the obligation she was doing, but it was her heart in the obligation. Is that she was distracted. All this to say, guys, when we're in the midst of a busy season 
and we're spinning those plates. We really need to get a different mindset. That Think about each obligation, each plate. It's not a plate, it's a mirror. It's a mirror that we can use to reflect God's glory. And if every obligation, we are going around and thinking, oh my gosh, this way at work, I can reflect God's glory. Oh my gosh, I get to go home and wash the dishes to give my wife rest, to give God the glory. And then I get to go on a Zoom meeting with my elders and talk about God. We're still doing Zoom meetings, just I kind of like it personally, if you know. But in every obligation, if we think of it as a way to glorify God, we're not running around frantically. Everything is an opportunity. It is a way to glorify God. Guys, when it comes to busyness, we're all given the same amount of time in a day. Busyness is just a perception. Really what it is, it boils down to each moment. What are we doing? Are we glorifying God? Or are we distracted? You know, during this, this time, what God would keep reminding me, and, and the elders can attest to this. Like, we'd always, when we start elder meetings, we talk about prayers for ourselves. And, and many times I would talk about uh, how busy it was. But a lot of times my prayers would be that God would just be with me in these times. I wasn't praying to be less busy. Because you guys know too, when you're in busy seasons, they don't last forever. But I just pray that for you guys, when you are in a busy season, that first of all, you understand that work itself is a way to glorify God. Take the time to rest, even say no to certain things. But guys, in everything we do, Let's please glorify God in such a way that we shine that love unto others. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so good. God, you are such an amazing, holy, incomprehensible God, Lord. And God, I just pray during these seasons that we find ourselves in, Lord, that we can just glorify you. That, God, as, as you tell us in Romans 12, 12, that we be constant in prayer. Not that we need hour-long prayers throughout the day, but just reminders, God, just everything we do, Lord, how can I serve you in this? This menial task, how can I serve you, Lord? Lord, that, you, you, that we come to you with our with our heavy burdens, Lord, and Lord, that you just give us rest. And Lord, we are so thankful for each and every moment. Lord, you are such a good and holy God. In this and all things I pray, amen.